to what comes up a lot about why am I living where I am, why didn't I stay where I was, how did I make that decision, why did I leave the United States. So let's, let's get down to it. And to those of you that already know my life story, and if you watch these videos, you pretty much do, um, feel free to give me a like and catch the next video. Okay. Never met my father, came from a broken home, no violence, please. Um, and I'm very happy with how my life went when I was young, but at eight years old, I was pretty much alone in the house to take care of myself, get ready for school. And we were poor. In the United States today, the poorest people live better than probably 90% of the world's population. But I'm old enough to Despite the fact that I have all my hair and I don't have any gray up here, um, I'm old enough to be from a time where those things didn't exist. And if it did exist in any sense, uh, there was such a pride issue that that came into play. I do know because we got probably three or four times what they call government surplus, where you got these cans without labels and a block of cheese, processed cheese. Um, you would go and stand in line outside of some government warehouse and they give you a cardboard box and put some things in it. Big, I remember a big gold tin can of spam, basically. It's not like that was available all the time. I don't know the nuances of that. I was, like I said, I was eight years old and and after so i was alone a lot we lived in the country and there were times when well this is how poor we were we had no indoor toilet um and in upstate new york six months of the year it's glacial it's cold most of the world doesn't understand what real cold is so there was no indoor toilet we had no running water um we had to cut wood from the woods around us, gather up uh, trees that had fallen and chop them up and, and put it in a wood stove. And, you know, that was my life. And so, you know, at a young age, I'm foraging for food, I'm wandering through the woods for something to do, and literally out hunting to eat. I ate a lot of squirrel, <laughs> a lot of gray squirrels. Um, didn't know how to skin them, didn't know how to cook them, but you know, you, you figure it out. And so that was my life up to the age of 10. And then at 10 years old, I actually went to work. I was working in an automotive junkyard. By the time I got to 15, I'd had enough of the way I was living and figured I could do better on my own. And so I left home at 15. I got a job washing dishes and continued with school. I lived in a what had once been a small, cheap motel with five or six rooms that was pretty much just occupied by alcoholics. But they didn't care. They gave me a room. I'm 15. Said, so yeah, sure, here's the keys. Just pay what I, I don't remember. It wasn't very much. And so my job washing dishes paid for that, put gas in the car that I had that I worked one summer for, and um, so that was my life. When I was 19, this was during the Vietnam era, Country Joe and the Fish, one, two, three, four, what are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. Yeah, it was those days. So uh, my number came up in the draft. So I went with my best friend at that time, John Bills, went down to see the Marine recruiter. 
because I didn't want to go in the draft because you heard all kinds of terrible things if you go in the draft, you go in the army and you just, I just, if I'm going to go in, I'm going to go join the best. Of course, the weekend prior to making that decision, we sat and talked about should we just run away to Canada because that was kind of a popular notion at the time. But I couldn't bring myself to do that, so I joined the Marine Corps. I went in the Marine Corps and um, spent almost all of it overseas. I was in uh, six years, two months, and, you know, the deal. A little over six years, I was in the Marine Corps active duty, and two of those years were in the United States, the rest were overseas. I was in the Vietnam airlift. I, lived in Japan for a while, traveled all over the place. I was in helicopters and helicopters are attached to ships um, so I traveled a lot. So by the time I got out of the Marine Corps I had already seen uh, you know both sides of the world, the Asian side and the European side. I traveled a lot, I'd seen a lot, had a lot of different experiences, uh, made some serious friendships, saw things that people shouldn't see ever and I raised myself to be fiercely independent and so you know that's how my life has always been I've always been a dominant personality I've always been the owner or manager of a business I have to call the shots yeah I know I can be pretty obnoxious that's just how I am and but the upside is when you travel you don't worry you don't fear you're very comfortable and confident and it doesn't mean you don't take precautions, it doesn't mean you're going to be stupid, but you don't have to look over your shoulder all the time. What happens is going to happen, but um, I was always able to take care of myself. Uh, when I lived in Japan, I was intensely studying art, martial arts. And so, you know, with the background that I had, the history I had, um, you know, I had a certain vigor and strength and, and knowledge to carry me through different situations. So what's the point of all this? Am I bragging? No, I'm kind of leading up to how I made my decision. So as you know, at one point I came to Columbia and while I was in Columbia I met somebody and we got married and had over eight years of a wonderful marriage, a wonderful person, one of the best people I've ever known. Um, excellent person. Um, the divorce that we got was something we mutually discussed, but it wasn't over the fault of either one of us. What those things are is nobody's business, but um, you know, it's, I don't want anyone to misunderstand and cast aspersions on her or me because it wasn't like that. We were both very good people. We were very true and honest to each other, and it was a an amazing marriage. So now we come up to the point where I get sick and I didn't know what it was at first. I don't see doctors on a regular basis except for a few things where I had pneumonia real bad once and practically died from it. And a couple little things that people have along the way and for the most part it was a pretty healthy life. So one day I'm getting ready to go to work. There's a big meeting. I'm a vice president of a very large company. And so I'm getting dressed and I got my tie on. And I sneezed. I'm ready to go out the door and I sneezed. And when I sneezed, I sneezed out all this blood. So I don't know what those bleed, but what happened was it started gushing like a faucet and it didn't want to stop and I'm covered in blood and it's, it's not stopping and I'm starting to freak out a little bit. And it was about 15 minutes before I could get that to stop. I don't have nosebleeds. I don't know what the heck that was. So I got it cleaned up. I, I was actually late for that meeting because I had to change my clothes. I had to shower again. and So I go on just hey what happened it was weird and then I found myself losing my balance constantly losing my balance to the point where I'd, I'd fall into a chair and I pretend like I was just sitting down funny and I 
it, it affected me in a lot of ways that was getting worse day by day, but it went on for months. And um, I went to see a doctor and told him, and I, it was, well, it's this, this, and this, don't worry about that. And it's, you know, I, it's, we didn't get any answers. And, I, and it got to the point where I was having trouble standing up. And it was affecting my thinking because I was so um, preoccupied with what I was struggling with that it was it was interfering with my my thoughts. Um, it's hard to think about something and plan something when you're consumed with I don't want to fall over and bash my head. And so this is what I went through for a number of months. And of course. Um, you know, my performance at work was just falling apart. I was falling apart. I kept going back at that point to see doctors and I just really wasn't getting answers. I won't go through all the different things they thought, but it certainly wasn't helpful. And then I got to the point I just couldn't work anymore. I couldn't drive anymore. It, it got bad. And so uh, I decided to go to the VA hospital. I had never gone before. I always knew it was there as a benefit. I've got a lifetime benefit. Uh, I've actually got an amazing benefit package that a few people, a few, I don't know how many thousands during Vietnam, if you were, there's a particular formula, but if you were part of that, then you get this benefit package anywhere in the world for the rest of your life. Most people get in the United States with provisions. Mine is unlimited, completely unlimited for the rest of my life, anywhere in the world, including Ecuador. So. I decided to go to the VA. Well, let's check it out. I, I didn't know what else to do. I, I had to do something. So I go to the VA. I'm going to leave out the details. It went on and on. There was lots of testing. There was another thing discovered while I was there. And there were painful tests. And it was just really obnoxious, annoying. And I ended up having to stay in bed because I my equilibrium was so bad, I was literally at risk of killing myself if I didn't stay in bed. So two and a half years I was in bed. Well, this stuff went on and on and on and on. So finally, it comes down to it where uh, I had cancer and I had cancer throughout my body. And it was the same cancer that my older brother, who was uh, 10 years older, he got that very same cancer 10 years prior and died from it. And it was very aggressive and he didn't live long after they figured it out. And so they uh, pronounced that I had this very same cancer and uh, I heard them talking out in the hallway, a couple doctors, a professional that, or a specialist that was brought in, one of the nurses that had been taking care of me, uh, the care at the VA in Durham, North Carolina was freaking amazing. It was amazing. Um, I felt like I had millions of dollars and I was paying for the best care possible on this planet. But that aside. But I overheard them talking about how I was going to die and I didn't have much longer to live. And But they were going to operate on me on this ear, take this ear off because it was a tumor that was affecting my balance and that was the root of that problem. And so they were going to at least do that. And then um, in some lymph nodes where the cancer was, they're gonna take those out since they were right there. So they go in and they do that. My head was, I was already fat by that point. My head was swollen from the operation where they took my ear off. It was supposed to be about, a, 30, 45 minute operation. I ended up uh, five hours. Uh, I never did find out what complications. I know they had trouble waking me up and I was told that I actually had died at some point, but they revived me. So I eventually I came around. Yeah, it kind of, <laughs> kind of sucked. It hurt. I never did get feeling back on some of this. But I had to go back through one of these radiation CAT scan things uh, after the operation. Uh, cancer was gone everywhere. Everywhere they had mapped it, it was completely gone. Nobody could explain it. They had to run the test again and then again because they thought there had to be something wrong with the machines. Um, 
So I'll leave it to you to figure out what that is. I know there was a nurse that was praying for me, literally praying for me, and she is absolutely convinced that it was a miracle. I have no idea, but I went from being in bed, sick as a dog, to being over it, and now I just have to get my life back. So, as, look, I just grew a couple inches. So, as I was in bed, I was doing some uh, consulting work on, on the internet, and uh, I was also trying to think about where I would live when this was all over. And yeah, I know they said I was going to die, but I didn't believe it. My whole life has been in situations that were very dangerous and I probably should have died. And I never did. And so I, I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but I, I had this thing where I actually believed I was invincible. I mean, if you asked me, I would say, no, of course, that's, that's ludicrous. And I, I knew on an intellectual level it was ludicrous, but I have to tell you that for some reason, I just believed that. So when they told me that I was going to die of this cancer, I overheard it. And then I questioned them later. I heard what they're saying. And based on what happened to my brother and, and the, t the test that I'm looking at, I, I didn't doubt them. I just didn't ever believe I was going to die. And so as I'm sitting in bed, uh, and I was back and forth to the hospital, I needed to figure out what I was going to do when I got done with all that. And I knew that I wasn't going to be in a situation where I could really go back to work and been a number of years away from it. And I was just so fat and out of shape and um, mentally, emotionally, and kind of put through the ringer. I just couldn't see, I wasn't going to be going back to work. And so what do I do? Do I move back to New York? Do I stay in North Carolina? Do I, I, I didn't know what to do, so I had to kind of figure that out. And I came to the conclusion that what I would do is go where I couldn't be bothered by people that I knew. And I know that sounds terrible. Bothered might not be the best word. But I knew that I needed to sort everything out on my own. I didn't need help. I didn't need sympathy. I didn't need, I, I just needed to have alone time to kind of come to terms with everything that had gone on. And at, at the point that I'd made that decision, I didn't know that I was actually going to come out clean for sure, but I just, that's just what I believe. So I, I planned that way. Now, when I'd been in Columbia before, I had decided that it's second favorite place in the world. I absolutely loved it there. And I dreamed of maybe someday if I retire, what a great place it would be to go live there. Um, and I've covered why in the video coming up about why do I love Columbia. But um, when I was there the last time, it was quite dangerous, but it didn't bother me. But I was in good shape. I was strong, I was healthy, I could take care of myself. Well, you know, fast forward 10 years at that point, I could not take care of myself. I could, you know, I couldn't, I, I could barely walk or not walk depending on when I was going over this. So uh, I couldn't picture myself going back to Columbia where I needed to be able to take care of myself and I couldn't. I wasn't gonna put myself in that situation. Otherwise, I would have gone to Columbia. Uh, where's my first favorite place? Uh, excluding the United States, which I think is the most awesome place on the planet. With hell holes throughout the country, but the, overall, it's, it's an amazing country. But my first favorite place outside of the United States was Japan. I love Japan, but I knew I couldn't afford to live in Japan. I'd lived there before. And you really have to be working to live in Japan. And again, I wasn't in that situation. I didn't know when or if I'd be able to work again. So Colombia, I kind of, I kind of have to rule that out. And I thought about all kinds of places. Thailand, I love Thailand, and uh, I've been to Philippines, and I thought about New Zealand, and you know, I, I've been all over the world. I thought about all of these places, played them through my head. 
wrote down, you know, reasons of plus and minus and all of that. I spent probably, I don't know, months and months going over this. And then I had a, I had a friend who was from Ecuador and spent some time in the United States and she was back in Ecuador and I said, I need to contact her because Ecuador is right next to Colombia. Wouldn't it be like the same people? So I contact her. So we're talking back and forth and uh, emails, messages and things. And uh, so I decided I'm going to go to Ecuador. Now she clued me in on a lot of things before I went. And when I was there, we remained friends. And hello, Lisette. She answered that, you know, I didn't have to worry about taking care of myself. So, all right, I'm going there. So I flew into Quito and then I needed an extra day to recover <laughs> just because I was so out of it. So I rescheduled my plane and then I took the plane to, to Cuenca and she met me with her uncle and they helped me, they helped me a lot in the beginning. And I stayed in this little rental place and I got an apartment real fast because I was just too sick to keep looking. So I looked at three places. I took the last one. I said, I'm done looking. I'll just take it. Turned out to be a, a nice place to live. I paid too much, but that's, you know, that's how it goes when you get there. And if you're in a hurry, you just grab something. And that's why I always recommend that people take a month, you know, unless you're in a situation like I was where you're just too sick to deal with it. So I'm getting off track. So here I am in Cuenca and it's a beautiful place and it's wonderful for many, many people. For me, it never was exactly what I wanted because what I really wanted was what I had lived through before. And there was always a sense of disappointment because it wasn't that. And I moved there hoping that it would be closer to it. That's nothing on Cuenca, that's on me. That's just how it was. Now, I will say that after the first year, I moved out to Giron, a small town just south of uh, Cuenca, uh, 40 minutes or less on the, on the bus for a dollar. And I loved it there. I felt at home, I felt at peace. And the year I spent out there, I was able to take my hermitdom and really sort myself out. You know, they say, find your happy place. I did, but I couldn't stay out there. It was costing me a fortune because I was living on, I was living on consulting work and the internet out there was so up and down. I mean, I tried it before I went out there, but I tried it during periods that apparently was good. It was so up and down, I couldn't do Skype calls. It would freeze or just, shut off. It, I ended up losing clients. I lost a lot of money. It had a had a big effect on me that way. And so when the year was over, I found the peace of mind that I was looking for. But based on mostly the internet, I decided to move back to Cuenca, where the internet is super. So I moved back and I had a good time. And um, yeah. Adriana and Sandy, they were wonderful. We lived together in one big house for, for a while. During all of this, I went a lot of places, did a lot of things. You saw it in the videos. I was all up and down the Andes. I went out to Salinas. It was all, all, over, uh, all over Ecuador and a little trip to Peru. I, I was making a bunch of trips to Colombia. So. But as great as Cuenca is, it was never that thing I was looking for. And every time I would make a trip to Colombia, I would see those things that I was missing. But I still wasn't sure. I was toying with the idea of moving to Colombia, but I was more of a, I could go six months to Colombia and six months to Ecuador because I have a life in Ecuador and I have many friends. Unfortunately, or I don't know if it's fortunate or not, but a couple gringo friends, but most all of my friends were uh, South American. And, and I miss them to this day. I, I wish they could be here with me. 
But the altitude had begun affecting me. And I don't mean the altitude sickness that you get when you first arrive and you get over that in a few days or a few weeks, maybe at the most. And you can take coca tea and different things and you get by it, drink a lot of water. It's, that's not the altitude I mean. I mean, I actually caught a condition, high altitude pulmonary edema, something like that, where because of the fact that I had had pneumonia once in a real bad way and it had scarred my lungs, which never noticed, but the altitude compounded the issue. So what would happen is all those nooks and crannies with the scarring and with the altitude issue, condition, whatever, with the altitude condition that I had, it would trap moisture. And the moisture would turn into like the flu symptom uh, or it would turn into pneumonia. And so I had pneumonia a couple times. and. I, that's not a good thing. And the doctor that, you know, once he figured out what I had, he said, you, you can't live at this altitude. You've got to get below 8,000 feet because at this altitude, you are at risk. You are at risk. You'll, you'll die early. Uh, you will constantly be sick. And it got to the point where for the last year I was there, I was sick all the time. I mean, when I, even when I felt good, I was still sick. It was, I was still having effect. It just felt better than the, the misery from the month before. So in the video, I'd say, oh, I'm feeling great, but I, I wasn't feeling normal. And, and so it was a bad situation. And that put, me over the, that put me over the top. I can't live in Cuenca anymore. Could I have lived in other places? I, I was asked about that. Yeah, I could have found something, but why? I was in Cuenca and wanted to stay in Cuenca because of friendships that I had that were in Cuenca. If I'm going to have to move anyway, then why not move to where I wanted to go to begin with? Uh, why do I need to find some kind of runner up? I mean, just to stay in Ecuador? I mean, what's, I, I have no particularly attachment to Ecuador itself. I mean, wherever you go, it's really about the culture and the people, but it's not about the, the government of a country, usually. Although I'm much happier with the kind of government they have here. Uh, but that's, you know, those are side issues. And so that's how I made the decision to come to Colombia on as permanent as I can be. I mean, who knows? My, my life goes day by day, but uh, yeah, I have no intentions of moving from here. And it's everything that I remember it as being. It's everything on the trips. Now, why didn't I go to Armenia? I can't tell you how many times I've been asked that because we know you love Armenia. You're always going to Armenia. You went to Armenia decades ago. Why aren't you moving to Armenia? And that's a great question because I have friends in Armenia. There's a family I love that's, that's there. I had every intention of going to Armenia. I was planning to go to Armenia and I had things kind of set up for that. But something came up here in Manizales, would help somebody else out, but aside from that, it would have made the transition easier for me. And so I decided, well, it's debatable, but <laughs> I decided I'm going to go that route because then come February when Elise was up or whatever, I, I could make a decision at that point and I could always move to Armenia because I'm not that far from it. So, you know, that decision, I haven't even been able to think about that because I've got so many other things going on. It's a nice town. Um, it's very pretty, picturesque. There's a lot of downside to it. It's more expensive than Armenia. Uh, it's... You know, I, I feel like I'm a mountain goat when I'm out walking around. But, you know, those things are neither here nor there. I don't know where I'm going to end up. I've got until February to make that decision. And I, so I have no need to make that decision now. So that's my life story in a nutshell, how I made the decision and why I ended up here where I am. Hope that helps.
See you next time.